So now I have finished as much as I could tell you about Weinberg and his physics. But I want to still tell you a few more things about his textbooks. He was a great and consummate teacher. And he actually has said this, that as is natural for an academic, when I want to learn about something, I volunteered to teach a course on the subject. And in his long life, he taught many, many courses. And almost every time, it led to a book. His first important books were two volumes on quantum field theory. And there are generations of particle physics students, including yours truly, which grew up on these books. And his scholarly monograph on gravitation and cosmology, principles and applications for general theory of relativity, actually is a book which was published in 1972. And it is really the cross-fertilization of the two disciplines of elementary particle physics and cosmology. And it is a book on cosmology that particle physicists like. It may not be a book that all the cosmologists like. But at least this is responsible for a whole lot of particle physicists, including again yours truly to be in, get involved and un, try to gain an understanding of cosmology and gravitation. So many a generations of particle physicists trained on these three books, in fact. So from the preface of gravitation and cosmology, I will tell you why particle physicists like this book. So he said that I found that in most textbooks, the geometric ideas were given a starring role. So that a student would come away with the impression that this had to do with space-time being a Riemannian manifold and has nothing to do with something physical. That was his objection to the earlier description of gravitation. And he said the important thing is to be able to make predictions about the images on astronomers' photographic plates. And it simply does not matter whether we ascribe these predictions to the physical effects of the gravitational field or curvature of space-time. I mean, I like this attitude that finally the role of a physicist is to understand what we see in experiments. That is the most important aim for which, uh, and then through it, understand the uh, secrets of nature. And I think it is this approach which attracted many of the particle physicists to the book and then to the field of uh, gravitation and cosmology. His most compulsive need, I would say, of clarifying and elucidating, then he penned a series of monographs and books on this subject. I already mentioned a book on uh, gravitation and cosmology. There was a sequel to it called Cosmology. And actually, that was important because between the 272 to 2000, cosmology had moved in leaps and bounds. And in fact, what I found in this book, which was amazing, was he was trying to give analytic understanding of the phenomena occurring in the early universe by using the latest experimental data and trying to abstract things in terms of few analytical expressions. I think that is a master piece. This particular book on cosmology, I studied many things from this, and I found it was a masterpiece. But then he said, OK, he wanted to go down to more elementary things, as we, things we learn earlier, such as quantum mechanics, modern physics. And I would say that his book on modern physics and his explanation of Rutherford scattering, I would advise all of you to take a peek at it. It's beautiful. In few lines, he explains to you why Rutherford experiment tells you that the size of a nucleus is much smaller than the size of an atom. In very simple back of the envelope calculation. That's simply amazing. So that was the beautiful beauty of his books, that they talked to the reader. They did not give any great scholarly rubric. And still, you know, they have lasting impact because they were accessible to the students, great clarity, but there was no compromise on rigor. So every statement was perfectly correct. You didn't really have to say, oh, here he is waving hands. Even when he waved hands, the waving of the hands was very precise, actually. And I have actually all these books, and I would say that these textbooks are the, one of the very, very important part of his legacy to the world of theoretical physics. Uh, then he went on to popular writings. His book on cosmology and gravitation is the one that actually led him to write the first popular science book, The First Three Minutes, in 1977. And many were to follow. The discovery of subatomic particles and the dreams of a final theory are two, are two which are very quite popular. This is the latest one, and this is the old one, which had, had given a lot of excite, a rise, a rise to an excitement. And I would say that his touchstone for popular science was 
that the argument must remain true to science. And that is actually very rare to find in a popular book. And I would advise you people, the ones who have not looked at these uh, books, to really take a look at it because it gives such a lucid understanding of very complex concepts of cosmology or for me, because that was something I learned from this book. And they still must remain accessible to an intelligent non-scientist readers and people say that he tried it on his lawyer wife before he sent it to anybody else to read. So I think it's important, he said, I think it's very important not to write down to the public. You have to keep in mind that you're writing for people who may not be mathematically trained, but are just as smart as you are. So that is how he wrote his popular books. He's